Hello and welcome to the F1 Feeder Series podcast, your guide to keeping up to date on everything in the junior single-seater world. I'm your host, Jim Kimberley, and after sampling the delights of Japanese Super Formula last week, this week it's about Great Britain. That's right, it's the season opening round of GB3 this coming weekend, and it's joined by the new championship called GB4. To preview the upcoming season, I'm delighted to say that we have the reigning GB3 champion and Williams Academy driver joining this week, it's Zach O'Sullivan. How are you doing today, Zach? Um, I'm all good, thanks. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me. I'm very, very happy to have you. Can't wait to speak to you and talk about your season last year and this year. And we've also got a driver who's taken a step from Formula Ford and into GB4 this year for Graham Brunton Racing. Welcome to the podcast, Logan Hanna. How are you doing? I'm all right. Thanks for having me as well. Yeah, very good to see you after uh, racing some cars as well. We're going to hear all about that. Your season's already underway. And we also have the debut of F1 Feeder Series GB3 and GB4 editor to help guide us through and understand the upcoming seasons. Hello to Richard Smith. Great to meet you. How are you? And are you excited for this weekend? Hi, uh, yes. It's great to be here. Really excited to be on the podcast. Um, Feeling great. Had a great uh, weekend. It's now in the start of GB4 and really looking forward to start GB3 Championship this week. It's all starting to actually get underway and all the seasons starting uh, completely, including now going to yeah, GB3. But before we properly get into it, just a quick reminder to like, comment and subscribe if you're watching on YouTube. And if you're listening to the audio only version, please leave a review on whatever podcast platform you're using. It really does help us out. Let's get started with the basics first. People have heard of Formula 2, Formula 3, Formula Regional, Formula 4. They might not have heard of GB3 and GB4. Rich, can you give us a bit of an overview and let us know how they fit in with the rest of the motorsport ladder? Uh, well, the GB3 Championship was known up until by midway through last season as the BRDC Formula 3 Championship. So I think that might help people understand a little bit more of where um, it is. It's effectively a step up from British Formula 4 um, and allows drivers to be in a series to help them develop before making the step up to FIA Formula 3 like Zach has done. Uh, the GB4 Championship is, is a brand new series this year um, and it's really a step up from Formula Ford and it'll be the first series that many of these drivers in the series have experienced um, slicks and wings racing, so something a little bit different for them. But it's a very similar level to the British Formula 4 Championship, although I think uh, these cars, the GB4s, that a little bit faster than those in uh, Formula 4. So it's both a great series. They're both cost-effective ways for drivers to go racing, and they both follow the British GT Championship um, throughout the season. So a great experience for drivers in the paddock, and they also have their own headline round at Silverstone as well. So plenty of opportunities for these drivers to, to really show the motorsport world what they can do. Yeah, it's a great weekend to have British GT, GB3 and GB4 for anybody who's going to be in the UK this coming well, spring, summer and autumn. Now, Zach, you're the reigning GB3 champion. What's your opinion on the series and what's the win done for you? And I'll talk about the series win because you got a lot of wins last year. Uh, How has that changed your life? Um, firstly, I think it's a pretty awesome series. Um, it was slots pretty well into the gap in between, I think, F4 and FIA F3, uh, and is far more cost-effective than, let's say, Formula Regional. Um, for me, it was a pretty obvious step up. Obviously, I'd already done two years in the UK, um, and also I could stay with Carlin. Um, I think had 2020 uh, not gone so well with Carlin, I don't think I would have maybe done GB3, um, but I think it was better to keep that relationship and move up. Um, and to be honest, I'd signed before I'd even tested the car, so... Uh, <laughs> It was a nice surprise when I tested the car. I think uh, I haven't actually driven the new one. Um, I'm still waiting if I get a go, but it looks really, really cool. Yeah, it's uh, you've got Carlin as such a spectacular team with such a racing pedigree. Of course, uh, there's a certain British driver who's not done too badly there. What's the best way to call it? What's the way that you see Carlin's progression through that? Are they speaking to you like we're going to get you into this car next year to give you that ladder? Um, I'd like to hope so. Um, I think I've got a pretty good relationship with Trevor now. Um, obviously, I've been with them for, for what is three seasons. Uh, took a bit of a gamble signing with them this year and 
in FA03. Um, so far, I think uh, it's a bit of a steep learning curve for both driver and team. Um, but yeah, ideally, I want to continue my um, kind of evolution through through the junior series and hopefully move up the ladder with them with them into into Formula Two one day. But uh, but yeah, I've really enjoyed my time uh, at Carl, and I really like the guys guys there, uh, and I'm a pretty professional outfit. Yeah, they really are. They're one of those teams, uh, like Williams almost, like a, if you're British, you've got that kind of affinity to them in some ways anyway. Now, GB3 particularly, Richard, um, the season starting this weekend, uh, it's a bit of a double question here. What are you expecting from this weekend and what are you expecting from the season as a whole as we go through the year? I think this year it's going to be quite fascinating because the grid is going to be much larger than there was last season. There's, I think, a lot of focus um, on trying to get the grid as, as big as possible for this year. And I know a lot of teams are putting as much effort to get as many cars out as they can. Um, you, there's only there's only a handful of drivers that are staying on the, the compared last year that are moving into the season as well. So there's going to be a lot of rookies on the grid. And for a lot of these drivers, they'll have already raced against the majority of the grid through uh, Formula Ford and various other curtain series in the past. So there's going to be rivalries that are going to carry over. Uh, and when you throw in that with the mix of the drivers that are going into their second year, their experience, and um, really wanting to prove themselves to a Formula 1 team racing academy or different series to try to step up to Formula 3, I think it's going to be a fantastic year and there's going to be some amazing racing, especially in those uh, the race 3 reverse grid races because you've got drivers that you have maybe around 20 plus drivers in the grid that all are capable of taking a race victory. Um, especially now for a race, it's going to be great in terms of overtaking and a real joy to watch. Logan, you're racing in GB4, but you're actually joining the GB3 championship this upcoming weekend. And we obviously are going to hear from you about uh, how the season's gone so far and how it's going to go. But having not necessarily uh, that level of procedure Formula One, but being a support series for a bigger series anyway. How are you expecting this weekend to change compared to your Snetterton outing? Um, to start with, I've been to Oldham before, so that helps. Um, <laughs> I, hadn't, I hadn't visited Snetterton um, before going last or the weekend before. Um, so kind of spent a bit of a day and a half with things coming at me quite quickly. The last few years, it's been racing around Knock Hill kind of, and that's it. <laughs> With the occasional trip to Brands or Silverstone National. So it's all been short circuit to jump into a, a new car at Snet Thursday. From where we were Thursday morning to Sunday afternoon was a big jump and it was the right sort of progression. But going into this weekend, I think it will be great to, to see more people coming and being interested in both the championships as well. Yeah, a lot of people are very, very passionate who turn up at these uh, these events. Zach, it is Alton Park that's uh, round one for GB3. Not a track you'll be visiting this year, but uh, a bit of a cracking track in many ways. Like it's got the forest area, it's got the outer area, it's got uh, druids, all these these kind of legendary corners. What should, well, uh, some advice for Logan. What should Logan look out for this weekend? <laughs> Look out for. Uh, so obviously I've driven it in oh, three cars now. So Ginetta Juniors, uh, F4 and uh, and now the GP3 car. Um, so I think obviously the GP4 car is a bit of an in-between step between the old Miguel British F4 car and the last year's GP3 car. Uh, it was a pretty big step up when I jumped to GP3. Um, and yeah, I really enjoyed the track, to be honest. In F4, I didn't enjoy it so much. We were on the shorter layout, but going to the, the full island loop in, in British F3 is really cool. Uh, and to be honest, yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. The car was always kind of bottoming out across all the bumps. Um, and it was probably the one track where qualifying was, was definitely the most fun part of the weekend. The racing was always pretty tricky to get close. Um, in terms of advice, I think it's one of those circuits where... Uh, it seems a bit counterproductive, but I think the quicker you get onto it, always the better. Um, I think it's something that maybe I didn't do when I first went there uh, and kind of spent the rest of the weekend, if you like, catching up um, to the drivers who really made sure to push early on in the first session um, because you've got to work out where all the cambers are, et cetera, and really find the limit quite early on. Um, otherwise, once you can, I think once you get into a rhythm around Alton, it's really, really fun. But I've been in the situation where I'm not in a rhythm uh, and it can get pretty tight after a while. A new time in eye racing, I'd say. And am I right in saying, because I've not visited Alton Park, but it makes sense when it's called Lakeside. There is actually a lake just over the barrier, right? 
Yeah, the, 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 there's a kind of lake next to the track that looks the same as the track layout. It's quite funny. Mm. Uh, I think there's a pond in the middle as well. But I, I knew that from last year when I crashed. So I just that's the, <laughs> pond the, rest of the race. But yeah, top quite advice a few for, top advice for Logan is don't crash and don't go into the lake. There's a good view though at Nickerbrook if you want to see the lake. Get all the advice from uh, from Zach about where to sit, everybody. GB4 as well. We've already started the season, Logan. Um, not the best start, I would say, for going at Snetterton, but you've suggested already you've not raced there before. What happened? Um, we hit a few teething problems in testing, which meant that originally we were supposed to go to Snetterton at the beginning of March, and we never did. And then the only track that we actually tested on that we're racing on this year was Donington for the media day. Um, so in terms of track time on long circuits and tracks that we're actually racing at, we've only had one day. And it was also hit with um, electrical and ma uh, mechanical issues and kind of it was a, white, a washout in the afternoon as well. So it was a, a day of not a lot of laps, unfortunately. Um, yeah. How are you adjusting to going from life in Formula Ford to now having, as Richard suggested, like the slicks, the wings, completely different, I presume, I've never driven one of these cars, a different level of driving, different style of driving? Um, well, I have. I had driven the, the this configuration of the F4 car in the UAE. I did the, um, I did the F1 support race in 2019 in this exact car. And I also raced the car back in 2017 in the champion, the F4 UAE championships first year, I think when I was 16 or something. <laughs> um, and it was like no time lost between jumping out of that car at the end of the F1 weekend to our first test when we went to Silverstone. It was just now a matter of learning those tracks in this new different car. Um, but the fastest way around a corner in a Formula Ford is a four-wheel drift, so it's not quite the same <laughs> as a single seater, but we're we're getting there. Is it like riding a bike for you, going back into the car then? Yeah, a little bit. When it rained at Donington, it was great because the car is not too different in the wet and we were always quick in the wet. So kind of it rained and we went straight out and kept going until we were told that we shouldn't be, be out there anymore. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm waiting for a wet round and I think we'll be able to to shine a little bit more there but for now it's just finding the limits of sort of the car and the tire which you would have done in testing pre-season but unfortunately we didn't get to do that. Now as somebody who's lived in Scotland and visited Knock Hill I'm sure you're very very used to um, some rainy weekends from <laughs> all the, the rain that falls up there. Yeah I have the joy of working up there as well so <laughs> I see it I see it a lot. <laughs> <laughs> This first weekend then, the first ever GB4 round, Richard, can you tell us about how it all unfolded? Yeah, it was a fantastic weekend. Um, it was great to be at Stetterton for a little piece of history. It was, it's nice mm. to be the first round of a championship. You know, Nicholas Taylor, the first uh, good qualifying in race one was pretty much untouchable. Um, it looks like he's going to set up a real title challenge. And then Alex Walker as well, winning the second race and and it was very good in the first race as well. He was putting pressure on Taylor at times. And then Megan Gilks uh, was incredible in the third race to take the victory. Obviously won a race in the W Series uh, a few years ago as well. Um, and then the battle for uh, for second place was split by 0 0.1 seconds around that. It was down the line. It was, it was brilliant. And I think especially with it being live streamed and there the, they had interviews of drivers, pre and post race it was professional both off and on track and it was very well run and I feel like it's a lot of people's opinion on it may have may have been fans of British Formula 4 that were a bit weary of a rival series as such being set up but I think the weekend in general I think will have sort of turned those opinions around because it was a brilliant weekend and it's set up a good platform for them for the rest of the season. You mentioned Megan Gilkes's win. When she, that's a reverse grid race, right? Because it's also a reverse yes. grid race that she won in W Series. Was that something leading from the front, good defence, or was that attacking? How did the, the race unfold? Uh, well, she would. She started from effectively pole position for the reverse grid uh, race. Um, she just got a girl on pole position and 
uh, Megan in second. So the reverse grid race is effectively, as you would expect, the qualifying grid is completely reversed round. Um, but you have to be within the 103% rule. And that's why uh, I think your uh, teammate, Logan, uh, Chloe Grant, and Christian Lester, uh, Rosa Verde, they, they weren't allowed to, to, to start from the very front of, of the grid. I think it's more of a, a safety thing and um, in order to sort of, to not let drivers who have been a little bit slower the weekend start from the very front with drivers much faster, more experienced behind them. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, as a rule, I think it's in GB3 as well. Uh, and I think in various series around the world as well. But uh, yeah, the first great race, it, it, was, it was a fantastic race and Megan was very quick out front. And then the battle, I think it was Max Maserati and uh, Elias Zedstam. Um, they were battling for second and their battle allowed Megan to sort of go off in the distance in the race of her own um, and with, with that battle came going uh, they, they were down the, right to the line it was near nearly a photo finish needed you know, 0.1 seconds so yeah it was great work and when Megan had the defence she defended well um, so great it was a great weekend from her Terrific stuff. And we talk about it being a new championship and we spent we mentioned costs a little bit earlier. Zach obviously didn't have the opportunity to do it. Should British F4 look at this as a rival championship or do you see this actually as a different level? Uh, it's a tricky one. Um, obviously, what British F4 has now is a kind of relevant car and tyre combination and engine, in fact, to, to rival F4 series. So I think on British F4, so that's a pretty clever move compared to what it used to be with the Miguel and Hancock combination um, that always kind of limited the comparisons between the two. I think obviously, as you said, the, the main benefit GB4 has is the cost. Um, you also get more rounds, I'm pretty sure, during the year. And I've said, as I said before, the cost is is the main factor. Um, with these new cars, from what I've heard, British F4 has had a big, big increase in price from what it was. It used to be pretty cost effective, maybe compared to other F4 series. Um, but now due to the new car, um, and obviously it's still got the FIA badge. Um, the cost has gone up quite a bit. So perhaps it isn't maybe as desirable um, considering the tracks you get to race at compared to GP4. Hmm. And we saw Logan there just uh, clocked a little knowing nod about the cost there. It's something that gets brought up on the podcast time and time again, the, the high level of finance needed to join any championship. I'm presuming with your nod that that was something that was a consideration for you about what to do this year. Yeah, definitely. I've kind of been on the verge of sitting in a British F4 car for the last few years. First, I mean, I tested one first back in 2018. Um, and then I was on the YRD, so the Arden Young sort of driver academy thing, I guess you could call it, for six, nearly seven years from when I moved over from the UAE and that sort of stuff from karting. And we were always trying to find more and more money to get us into British F4, but it was just what we could put together would never be enough to kind of buy somebody else out of a seat or if somebody else came along with a bigger budget, obviously that that they would end up getting taken. And that is kind of where Formula Ford fit perfectly in for us because as a, a young driver, not having to deal with wings or slicks and knowing that if you make a change on the car, you can feel it straight away and the racing being close as well and cost effective, it was the the move, the right move for us. Richard, just a little bit off the cuff, this question, but do you expect with that level of entry being a little bit lower, something we'll actually see these drivers attract different levels of sponsors because they're actually getting the chance to prove themselves compared to so many who never actually make it into uh, single seat of formula racing because now they actually have an opportunity. Is this something we should be excited about? Yeah, it's, Definitely, it's a, it's a good way for drivers to sort of show the worth, given how it's been live streamed to professional standard and it's been run very professionally. It's given them that platform. And I think the the grid for the Snerton round, it was only 12 drivers. It, it's quite small for a, for a feeder series. Um, and there, But there's a few teams that have, I think, purchased cars or in the process of purchasing, purchasing cars that will hopefully be racing in, in future rounds, but it's a it's a very good way for for drivers to said to show what they can do, and for sponsors watching, they know that given at the moment with the smaller grid, a lot of those drivers have more airtime, and the drivers who will be fighting 
at the front of the grid. Um, I will know sort of the, the real title contenders uh, over the next few rounds. They'll be able to, you know, the, the sponsors will be able to say, well, this is what, you know, opportunities they can get. This is what we can offer. And maybe go more into next season when they look back on how successful the season has been. I think going forward, it will, it will help drivers from next season, the season after, to make that step up with less financial backing than what you may need for British Formula 4. Mm. And Zach, on, on that, and we've got more questions to, to ask about this, including some from the audience, but the cost, and you'll be aware of it, and now you've got an academy backing you. I don't know all the ins and outs of your contract, how it works with Williams, with other drivers there, and I know there's different ways that Ferrari handle their academy, for example, but do you have expertise helping you in terms of bringing up sponsors, or have you said the Williams name dropped into conversation, which just automatically gives you more credibility? Um, it's always been tricky. Um, I've had some pretty loyal sponsors since I, I joined Cars, to be honest. Um, I contacted them back when I joined Junetta Juniors. Um, and luckily since then, I've been in the top two in each championship I've been in pretty much. So um, they felt the need to carry on um, and increased kind of the price depending on the budget of the series each year. I mean, don't get me wrong, they're not fully funding my racing, but they're certainly a help. Um, and I can completely understand it's so difficult to get sponsors at this um, lower levels, um, even in FIA 3, let's say, because... Although the airtime can be good, there's not much for a company to gain being on the side of a, a race car, if you know what I mean. So, um, yeah, as you said, obviously, at the moment, Williams is a significant help um, towards my budget for FIF3 and hopefully beyond. So at the moment, that's a, a main help. And it's, I wouldn't say rescue me, but from now on, it would have become pretty difficult, I think, um, financially to really sustain it over multiple years. So, uh, yeah, pretty grateful for that to come at the right time. The step up in racing also comes with a step up in cost, right? So Williams is very much helping, I would imagine. Let's stick with you for the moment, Zach, because let's talk about FIA F3. Um, it'd be rude not to when we've got you on the podcast. How are you adjusting to, to life, making it into, well, a Formula One feeder series on the Formula One weekend? Yep, uh, I'm really enjoying it. Obviously, one round done so far in Bahrain, so pretty interesting place to go to, hmm. to kick, off, kick off our campaign. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed the round. Um, obviously, we've had some difficulties, I think, car-wise. We're not quite there on pace, which is uh, to be slightly expected at the moment. But uh, yeah, I'm just doing what I can at the moment. I think qualifying, um, I can get reasonably close um, and hopefully stay within the reverse grid. Um, then the race pace gets a, a bit trickier. But so far, I'm really enjoying uh, really enjoying my time there. It's a really nice atmosphere. Um, and also, we get to, to race the tracks. I know it sounds a bit silly, but in when they're the best looking, if you know what I mean. Because usually, uh, for instance, in GB3, when we go to Silverstone, it's not on Grand Prix weekend. The Kate curbs aren't painted as well. So it's always nice to go to the, the tracks and they're looking pristine. If you want to impress Zach, get the paint out. That's what I'm hearing. <laughs> but in all seriousness, the... The, like I said earlier, the prestige of things, Formula One is prestigious. They do it properly. And I've been to race weekends where it's not a Formula One weekend, and I understand exactly what you mean. Are you finding like you've, obviously you want to be in Formula One, but if you feel like you've kind of made it almost being on the same grid, I know it's not the same paddock at the moment, but are you feeling like having all the, all the media attention, all the cars, all the stuff, like is that something you're, finding i don't know exhilarating maybe um it was pretty cool Bahrain wasn't quite so luxury we were in kind of glorified tents um and they were you, kind you're of used to that though right <laughs> exactly but it was worse than the normal awning so it's constant sand blowing through. it wasn't very pleasant um but uh hopefully it gets better throughout the year and i think a couple of the rounds we get to to go in the the spare garages but yeah as you said it's really cool to have the media attention um of F1 and also general fan attention. Obviously, unfortunately, Bahrain doesn't usually have the biggest turnout spectator-wise, but I'm sure when we go to Im Imola, there'll be plenty of uh, Tifosi on the entrance to the track, etc. So, um, yeah, that aspect is really cool. Um, maybe I'm not going to get enough media attention at the moment, but hopefully if the results pick up a bit, I'll get a bit more. I'm sure they will. Uh, let's talk about, well, Imola coming up as well. So, what, a couple of weeks away from that. How did you find Bahrain uh, briefly? What are you expecting from Imola? Have you raced there before? And do you have any championship targets as the season progresses? Um, so, yeah, going back to Bahrain, I enjoyed the weekend. Um, I think qualifying, I felt like I did a pretty good job considering uh, where we thought we'd be prior to the session. I think we had a pretty shocking free practice. Um, and to get into the reverse grid just about was a bit of a result, I think, considering. Um, the race was 
kind of what I expected, to be honest. Um, the target was to try and see if I could break DRS early on and then mm -hmm. stay with, with Ollie in the Premier as long as possible. Uh, I knew it wasn't going to be too sustainable. And then unfortunately, yeah, I lost the, the rear tyres trying to at least stay in DRS. So, um, yeah, it's a pretty tricky one in the, in the race situation to manage. I think um, if you have a kind of inherent lack of pace, you're always slightly on the back foot um, and have a bit of a, less of a margin to tyre save, if you like. Um, and especially with DRS being so powerful, it's pretty critical to, to stay in that one second. Um, and then going forward to Imola, I haven't been there before, nor tested. Uh, so I've tried to, we had a test program during the winter trying to get to most tracks as we can. Um, uh, because I haven't been to any really, but Imola, um, we haven't been to. So I've got 45 minutes to learn the circuit and see where I end up. But, um, but yeah, it should be good fun. Uh, and I think I'm looking forward to the fans as well. It should be really fun. Yeah, it will be really um, packed, I would imagine. I saw how busy it was at Australia. So I don't know if <laughs> Ferrari are doing as well as they are. Are you jumping in the simulator? I know Williams have quite a state-of-the-art simulator to help learn the track. Um, yes, I was down there last week doing a bit of stuff um, at Imola uh, just to get my eye in. Obviously, in an F1 car, so maybe my references are slightly out, but it was uh, it was good to get my eye in. Obviously, I, I know Imola from from all sorts of games, from eye racing, etc. Um, but it's good to see what their 2021 model is like, for instance, um, all up to date and laser scan. So yeah, obviously, a sim gives you so much, but still, when you get to the track, um, there's always little bits to learn. But in the past, I haven't found learning tracks so bad. So hopefully, uh, hopefully I get onto it quite quickly. Logan, obviously not an F3 yet, but is simulator slash iRacing slash gaming in general, is that something you've been doing to try and learn the tracks or are you finding it's not as useful as it might be? Um, I don't personally have one at home, but the team has one um, up in the workshop. So I'll go up there as much as I can. Um, but again... I think you can only pound around on a computer game so many times the week before. And then it really is seat time in the car to be able to learn the car on that track, especially when all the other drivers in the championship are pounding around every other weekend or every other day, um, especially at the moment. Like, for example, I think there's a test tomorrow at Alton and then there's a Thursday test and a Friday test before the, the race weekend. And we're only doing the Friday test. Um, so... I would like to be in the car, but if a simulator is all I can all I can get, I'll take what I can get. Now, as much as we could ask questions all day, F1 Feeder Series isn't for us, it's for you. And we want to make sure our audience all feel involved. So we're moving on to the part of the podcast where our viewers and listeners have their say with hashtag AskF1FS. If this is your first time watching or listening, you can get involved by using the hashtag AskF1FS on Twitter, joining our Discord and using the podcast questions channel, or simply commenting on our YouTube videos and asking whatever it is that's on your mind. We're going to start still with you on this, Zach. This is from Charlotte, who wants to say, who wants to ask, should I say, Bahrain was a great start to the year, great pace and quality. Do you have any expectations or hopes for the rest of the year? Um, I'd say it's pretty hard to put a number uh, on the expectations. Uh, I'd say personal targets are to be kind of maximizing the package I have. Um, whatever it is, obviously, as a team, we're going to be working pretty hard to try and improve the car um, as quickly as possible. So I think it's a bit of a moving goalpost in terms of targets. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's more personal targets. Um, and if I meet all those, hopefully the results should follow along with maybe some car improvements. So, uh, yeah, it's a bit of a long road ahead, but I'm looking forward to a different kind of challenge because uh, previous year I've been in a championship winning capable car, if you like. Would you say, because you say putting a number on it, would you say that it's more beating your teammates? I mean, you did that already. Is there that sort of level that you try and look at to think, okay, this is the, what I should achieve and that will prove I did a, I did a good year? I guess so. Uh, I mean, they're the only people kind of in the in the same boat as I am, if you like, with identical cars. So, uh, yeah, I mean, that's always a kind of good reference, if you like. Um, but yeah, I think, I mean, I don't think anyone can fully outperform a car, but I think performing to the maximum of what I have um, will be a, a kind of a key target. Um, and I know it sounds a bit silly, but trying to scrape into reverse grids um, would be quite a nice thing. At least it gives us a chance um, in the first race to score some points. Is that something you can actually do, though? Can you say how much off am I of a P12 finish? Because I, I spoke to Oscar Piastri about this last year because it was going to be really impactful for Formula 2, right? That I said, did you think there'll be any games? And he just said, I just don't think it's possible that you can aim to get middle of the pack like that. 
Well, I think if it's not possible in a frame, then it's definitely not possible for me. <laughs> I think it's got to be, I mean, Bahrain was like a kind of perfect quality lap and I, I just got in. So I think maybe if you wanted to, you could accidentally make a mistake if you're in a Prima or an ART this year uh, and get P6 or P7. But um, but but yeah, I think it's going to be pretty tricky. And I think last year was a bit more crucial because you had two races reversed, if I'm correct. So uh, yeah, it got a bit messy sometimes last year with people qualifying on pole and, and 12th. Yeah, it was, uh, I think everybody's universally praised going back just to two races yeah. per weekend as fun as it was to have that many races to watch this next question is from it is Verstappening and they say in what way does Motorsport UK and I'm going to add uh, an MSV help its associated drivers uh, Logan let's go with you on this one um Motorsport UK has been great I've been a part of their sort of I guess Team UK Academy for the last two maybe three years now after Covid because I think we got brought in the start of COVID, COVID happened and then they reinstated us for our first year again. Um, but no, they've been great. We get sort of days to go down and have workshops and sit with them and do more classroom stuff and kind of talk to different racing drivers that maybe have been through the academy previously and talk sponsorship, nutrition, all that kind of stuff that you can take away. But we also get to work with Porsche Performance um, as well to have a check up on our fitness and maybe help us in ways that we, we maybe didn't quite know about um, in terms of how we can brace our bodies for race weekends and that sort of stuff. Is the stuff you actually found useful, like learning that you just wouldn't have thought of if it wasn't for that sort of support? Definitely the sort of the sponsorship and the business side that they, they also delve into. I guess the same way that Zach's got people Williams that can help them with sponsorship that they do they kind of lay it out in a guide and tell you that you need to include all this sort of stuff when you're going to approach someone um they're not going to give you names and numbers unfortunately um an open book of <laughs> um people willing to spend money but they will give you the tips and tricks of the trade to to try and get it over the line anything from you Zach just regarding well motorsport UK there but also I know very drivers are very precious about the tips and tricks for that, but for somebody maybe five, six years your junior, what they could be doing? Uh, well, I'm not affiliated with Motorsport UK, but uh, but apart from that, I think sponsorship wise, it's always a tricky one. I think um, as many from experience, as many people as you can contact, the better, because uh, after a while, surely someone's going to at least give it a, a consideration. But uh, I agree, it's so tricky. Um, I think it's about using kind of any contacts you have, whether it be friends, whether it be family. Um, and I think it's important to find people who actually have a, an interest in motorsport, if you know what I mean, because it takes a lot to put your name and sometimes a couple of hundred thousand pounds on the side of a car. So um, yeah, if the person, it, obviously some people will go for big companies, let's say, but if the, the company has no interest in motorsport, um, then it's never gonna work really. Um, and sometimes an issue we found in the past is that actually some companies are, are not willing to support motorsport due to their kind of eco movement, let's say. So it's becoming increasingly difficult, I think, uh, and especially the way motorsport's moving. I mean, it's astronomically expensive now. It's getting pretty out of hand in general, um, especially for especially F3 and F2, to be honest. So, uh, yeah, I think something needs to be done um, because there's more and more drivers now falling off the ladder quicker than ever. Yeah, we're all sharing that frustration at F1 feeder series. It's starting to become far more inclusive which is terrific but then at the same time it's coincided with the costs becoming astronomical so this question kind of ties in what we were speaking about earlier Zach from Sam via Twitter who wants to know how has joining an F1 academy changed your aspirations of getting to F1 and who you could join if you were to get there um obviously for me it's raised my aspirations pretty high um higher than they were at least because uh I think we've seen plenty of times, even with Oscar now kind of having a year out, um, you can do everything correct and there won't be a space. So as much as it's about talent and money, it's also about luck because there's been so many times where talented drivers have just kind of hit a dead end at the end of Formula 2 uh, and there's been no seats available. Uh, I think what I've got with Williams is obviously a bit more financial support now, uh, hopefully through the rest of my, my junior career. Um, and I think if I do everything right, then an available seat at the end of it, hopefully. Um, but yeah, aspirations are slightly higher, but again, it's gonna be pretty tricky, I think, to, to find a space. Do you find it quite encouraging though, when you see Oscar's situation, that he's done everything, everything right, more so than quite a lot of drivers to find no light at the end of the tunnel. 
Williams haven't really had that problem. They've been putting their drivers into the seat. Is that something you actually find I'm in the right place? I mean, I'd rather be here than, say, in an Alpine Academy. I think for sure. Uh, and especially now with Doralton's new new finance, I think the academy's turned into a proper kind of competitive academy, if you know what I mean. I think there's there's more focus now on kind of financial support um, and in-season support, a bit more on being involved with the, with the F1 team itself. Um, and also it's not too saturated. You've seen a lot of the academies. I'm not going to name too many, but uh, there's so many drivers you can't We really know count. who you mean. <laughs> if you want an um, energy drink, right? Each year you see another four or five getting introduced. So yeah, I think it's good to be, uh, well, there are four or five of us now. Um, so not too many and also um, less than to kind of spread their attention over and hopefully get a bit more individual focus on each driver. Yeah, we were speaking to Yuri Vips not long ago, who says he goes months on end and saying there's so many of them before he even realizes, oh, you're actually in the Red Bull uh, junior team as well. It's, it's spread quite a lot. Uh, Richard, I'm going to put you in the hot seat a little bit with this, with the different academies and the routes to getting to F1. Are you viewing this? I'm going to ask you because you're not one of the drivers who has to give a politicized answer. If you need to get an F1 at the moment, you have to be part of the academy because I'm looking at, Felipe Drogovic leading F2, but what's he going to do if he wins the championship? Yeah, it does seem to be heading that way, um, especially if the chances for drivers to go straight into one of the, the main title contending teams is very slim at the moment anyway with, with drivers and long-term contracts. And the seats that are available, they're very limited. And usually though that team will be affiliated with another team through an engine supplier or and usually they may have, you know, there might not be anything officially to say that there's a link, but you know, th- there's contacts built up, up in there that have a a team that has a provision engine for for another team in the grid that they want one of their drivers on. They'll use their contacts to try to get into it. Without a driver academy it is going to be very difficult. And even with the drivers who the past few seasons have stepped up or, or switched teams uh, or joined teams that isn't exactly their uh, their junior team that they were in, they were still part of a junior team. So I think the teams are looking for that, the experience of being in that and what you can learn from that in order to sort of be able to step into Formula 1 with some level of ease. Yeah, so. Everything, you talked about the cost earlier, Zach, as well, but everything just seems to be in a different world at the moment with uh, how the feeder series are progressing as time goes on. On to something a bit more lighthearted and easy, though, uh, this question from, this one rolls off the tongue, EXKDJD via Twitter. What car number will you choose if you ever do get into Formula One and why? Logan, let's go to you on this one first. Is it something you know. thought of? Your <laughs> it's not something I thought thought of over the last few years. I've ran number nine, but that for no particular reason, it was a shorter version of my karting number, which was originally ninety two. But then, whenever you went to go sign on, it was at the bottom of the list. I didn't like it being at the bottom of the list, so I just chopped the two off it, so it put me back up to the top of the list. Um, because I think chopped, if I could was... have chopped the nine off it and gone even higher. <laughs> Yeah, but I, I, I much prefer to be sort of mid-pack there rather than signing my name at the top of the list. Um, but no real affiliation to the number nine other than the fact that I've kind of ran it for so long. So maybe number nine if it's available at that point, but we'll, we'll never know. Not the superstitious type of driver who wears the same pair of socks or anything like that then? No, <laughs> no, not quite. How about you, Zach? Any of the numbers in particular? Uh, I'd say 51. Uh, I've run it for, for three years in cars now until this year, I'm 26. Um, I think it's a bit of a weird story. So originally I was uh, 55. Uh, my dad's first car, like a registration was 55. So I used that. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, I, I think every time I went, so I could, when I was doing club racing and karting, I could always use 55. Um, but it turned out it was quite a popular number with a number of drivers. So whenever I went to like a, a national race, they used to sign on before me uh, and I get demoted to what it would go up to 56 on weekends, go down to 53, 52. And the first weekend I ran with 51 was a, a race called Cartmasters. Um, uh, and I won the race. And I was like, okay, this is pretty good. And then the next race, um, I ran the, the GP plate, which you which you you run for winning it and finished second. And then I ran 51 for the next one and won again. So I thought, okay, 
51 it is um, so if I get a chance again. Uh, then I went to Europe a bit, so I couldn't choose my number and then came back to Janetta Juniors and went with 51. So it's the sort of thing you've just had the logic there so you can think you, 51 just works. Exactly, yeah. And, and it's funny because for Janetta Juniors as well, I was going to pick 55 uh, and then someone registered before me on 55 and I was like, oh, that's it. That's my sign. I need to go 51. <laughs> funny. So there is a bit of a thinking behind it. No, I think so. Um, I'm not usually too superstitious. I guess that's the only thing I have really. Um, but it's more logical because I won twice on it. So I think that's it. But no pre-race rituals apart from that eye review that's always going to make you be sure to win? Um, I don't know. I, I always get into the car from the right, but that's just because I find it easier rather than... Um, I get in from the left. I can't get my right... More contentious. Left. High enough. <laughs> yeah, I, like... I think last year I kept, because of the way my car was positioned in the garage, in the awning compared to the truck, it was the same as F4 as well. And I just used to walk out and it was on the right. It was easy. And then with the halo, I found it even easier getting in from the right. So I'm committing to the right now. <laughs> yeah, luckily, I've not had to contend with a halo yet, but I don't think I'd be able to actually get, get myself in the car. <laughs> well, but hopefully, Logan, at some point you'll, uh, you'll have to contend with it as you progress up. But equally, as the halo seems to keep finding its way further and further down the ladder to, for safety reasons too. Um, next question comes from Tom Evans Photography via Instagram. And Zach, I want to know, what are the main differences between regional racing, i.e. GP3, and worldwide, and worldwide racing, FIA F3? And what are the biggest things to get used to? Um, I'd say the one difference isn't too big is, is that, I mean, although the tracks are different, it's not a massive change for me. Uh, I'd say if anything, the tracks are a lot easier to learn. Um, a lot of the UK tracks are pretty unique. Um, a lot of them haven't been resurfaced apart from Silverstone for like 10 to 15 years. So there's a lot of different nuances, different tarmacs. Um, for instance, when we go to Donington, qualifying the, the best lap, no matter the conditions will always be on the last lap. It's impossible to damage the tires. But then we'll go to Stetterton and the last year it was like a one lap kind of shootout before the tires started to grain. So it changes massively track to track and you also have some pretty cool circuits. Uh, with GB3 we go to Alton Park and obviously British F4, uh, we go to Croft and Not Kill. So they were really, really cool. I enjoyed those two um, proper kind of driver's circuits. So actually since I've gone to Europe, I found track learning pretty easy. There's always a bit of runoff and a bit more room to kind of play with. Um, I'd say the main difference obviously this year for me, FIF3 is, is the car. Um, pretty different car philosophy wise the gp3 car was probably higher aero than power let's say whereas the, the mm -hmm. fia3 car is the opposite um and also a, a bit trickier to drive um again pretty different philosophy in terms of driving you have to maximize kind of longitudinal g instead of lateral g um partly due to the tires but also the weight of the car um but apart from that it's, it's not too dissimilar i think something unique to fia3 and fia2 is the lack of testing time and track time in general so uh GB3 was pretty generous with that. I had a Thursday test and a Friday test before qualifying. Um, British F4 was kind of more in line. I had two 30 minutes practices before qualifying on the Friday. So that kind of prepared me a bit more for it, let's say. Um, but yeah, having 45 minutes uh, and especially with the tires we have, it equates to about four push laps before qualifying, four or five push laps. So on a circuit like an Imola, um, I think we'll be doing a bit more running in, in free practice, trying to, even if the tire isn't optimal, trying to get some laps in, but yeah. I quite like it. I've always been able to get onto it quite quickly, but it definitely adds a new challenge. And if you're on the back foot, it's always a bit hard to make a gamble on setup going into qualifying. You've got that expertise there of Donington. Is there anything, Logan, that you know about Knock Hill, I'm going to say, because I presume that's your expertise, that you think, oh yeah, like, like we're seeing that you can do the push lap at the end because there's going to be so much grip. Any sort of tips for anybody going to be heading to Donington? Uh, Donington to Knock Hill? Um, in the single seaters, Sausage curbs are probably not your friends, and I think the floppies are there for a reason, um, <laughs> and that sort of stuff. Normally, I will for the touring car weekends they put the tire barrels out, but for the club racing they didn't have them out. And one lap into race one, and you would you would know exactly which driver will take it out, and away they'll go. <laughs> and they, they don't really run track limits on the club rounds, so it was you would damage your car before you actually do it, do any good. Um, for a lap time or anything, but uh, Knock Hill's not an easy place to to learn or to get right. But once you do, it's quite quite rewarding. You think that's your specialist subject in motorsport now? With the amount of laps you've put around there, 
yeah, I, I do. I do lots of laps. I can. I do did very many laps in a Formula Ford. I've done them in a GB4 car, even though we don't race there. And I've done many laps sat in passenger seats of various different cars as well. So I see it in my sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Well, maybe this will influence your answer to this question from CM Parfait 16, who's asked, what are your choices for the best tracks for junior championships like British F3, FIA F3 or the Ginetta Junior Championships? This goes to both of you, uh, Zach and Logan. Logan, let's go with you on this first. Is it Knock Hill? Um, yes and no, but I think it depends on the car. Um, I think because I've had the luxury to do so many laps, Round not killing a Formula Ford, which you don't have to worry about ground clearance or <laughs> sort of grinding out over a red sausage car, but you can take a touring car line through the chicane and it will float straight over. Um, I would say that prob that kind of track would suit more of a car like that. But I loved Donington and I really enjoyed Alton Park when we were there last year. So I think those two circuits are top of my list. But I've also sort of tested at Croft as well. So there's lots of British circuits that I think that are right up there We're quite got a, quite a plethora of cracking circuits in the uk zach you'll know a lot of them very well yeah um i, I got two tiers so one is i think for pure racing druxton is always the best um it, it's like an oval but it goes left and right it, it's so cool um <laughs> doesn't sound like an oval <laughs> yeah, it's awesome um and in genetic unions it's like the second round i think of my of the championship and i I can honestly say I've never been so scared in my life because the cars were floating around. I mean, we we're like four or five wide for the whole race. It can bump draft. It was so cool. Um, and it's the same in F4 as well, because in F4, it's all, all flat. And I think, I think it was a good tow. You're on the limiter for 18 seconds or something in sixth gear. So it's silly, but it's really good fun to drive. Um, and it, it's something so unique um, because all the cars are just set up for straight lines and straight lines only. So when you actually do get to the last chicane, the car is so hard to drive um, and it, it's always awesome. Qualifying's um, chaotic. Everyone's, it's all a big cluster trying to find a slipstream and there's cars backing up at the last chicane. So it's like Monza on steroids. So I'd say Thruxton is the best to hold a race. Um, in terms of driving, I go between Knock Hill and Alton. Um, mm. Knock Hill I really enjoyed in F4. Uh, it was really, really cool. Um, I think all the teams run a slightly softer setup. So somehow we were able to take all the sausage carbs. I don't know how, but, uh, but, but yeah, that was really cool. Um, racing wasn't so good, but I really enjoyed it. Um, I've been twice once it was snowing and the other time it was wet. It dried out a bit, but it was, it was snowing the first time. So, but yeah, I really enjoyed my, my time there. Um, and Alton, as you said, it's a proper driver's circuit. And I think there are many, many circuits like it. And also I quite like that it really punishes you, um, with any mistake. I mean, especially in the, the GB3 car last year. I mean, if you went off, there was a, over 90% chance you'd be doing quite a lot of damage. So it was nice to, the adrenaline rush was pretty cool to kind of be on the limit for that long, um, especially in a qualifying lap. And in the race, it was always a bit hard to manage risk versus reward. Um, and actually Brand's GP is quite similar to that. So yeah. Logan, so, I saw you grimace slightly there with uh, <laughs> the threat of what could happen. But Well, um, we were actually, the, the National Formula 4 Championship were at Open last year for the British GT round which GB4 or GB3 sorry we're at and it was that last race in the wet that it was like imagine driving down the motorway and you know when it's raining so much and you drive past the lorry and your windscreen wipers can't mm. keep up in the Formula Fords we only have one very tiny rain light that doesn't even flash so when you get so far out you can't see it and I think I went from I, I suffered lots of brake issues all weekend but in the wet you don't press the brake as hard so it was fine um and I think I went from 21st to 7th, purely following a little red light and everybody else darting off. But I think there was a few laps where all I could, I was following a red light and I couldn't see the edge of the circuit. But we didn't think about that at the time, obviously. But looking back, maybe not quite so nice. Eyes on the prize. It sounds like, Logan, with your experience with um, well, Knock Hill and that, that you could be a little bit of a rainmeister yourself. So... If we have a great British summer with a lot of rain, then potentially uh, boost yourself up the championship. Now, we're going to run out of time, so I need to kind of rush through these last ones. We've got well, this question, which I'm particularly interested in, um, from, again, it's from It's for Stappening. And they want to know, does an academy approach a driver or do drivers approach the academy to join a junior programme, Zach? Um, 
I think it can happen both ways. I mean, 90% of the time, um, the academy will approach the driver. I think the idea is then them taking you under the, under the wing. Um, and most often, they're not giving financial support as well. So, yeah, I was uh, approached by Williams. So I think that's the case for, for most drivers. I have heard of rare cases in some other academies where drivers can approach with a sum of money sometimes. Um, but, yeah, usually it comes with the, the academy approach, approaching the driver, let's say, um, impressing the, the series before, and then you go into the long contract negotiations, the sort out clause, et cetera, um, and, and the next racing series. That sounds like a nice problem to have. Uh, Logan actually spoke to Mia Shariesman, who heads up the Alpine Academy last year, and he said that he used to hear from drivers who having like particular parents from very karting age for, for Alpine of just sending emails, which then he figured out was copy paste emails to all the academies, not an approach you've tried yet. No, not yet. I've not sent any, any begging emails yet. Um, but <laughs> I, I don't know if it will be something that I do in the future, but no, you, you could have planted a seed. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it was uh, highly recommended from that, but I suppose from your perspective, the academies have been uh, open. I don't like to go down a gender route because I just see all races as races. But are you encouraged by seeing like Williams, Jamie joining there and got Ferrari with the, the having female drivers as well, that you think it could be something that might be a route into um, a higher series? Um, it could be. It definitely could be. And that could be either a young driver seat in a in an academy or a factory seat is in a mm. sort of world endurance team. Um, you can kind of swing it either way. I mean, the GB4 championship this year, the first three drivers that were announced were all female. Mm. Um, so it is it, definitely steps in the right direction. And um, I think there is definitely still more to be done, um, especially in some of the higher, higher ranks of the junior formula, but it is, it is steps in the right direction. I could go chapter and verse about uh, my thoughts on that with Jamie not actually making it into F3 or F2 this year, but don't have enough time for that. So I'm going to leave with this final question. This comes from BS19, otherwise known as Ollie Behrman on Discord. Oh. Question to you, Zach, who wants to oh. know what happened on race two, lap one, turn seven in Bahrain? Um. Well, I think I picked up some of Ollie's paint and Ollie picked up some of my paint. Um, uh, basically, uh, we went to the stewards about it. It was quite a funny kind of confrontation. Um, basically, I think it was Colette at turn six was quite over ambitious. Um, uh, I was trying to go around my outside and I was squeezing him. And I looked up and I saw Maloney kind of car on fire stopped. Uh, and then I saw Colette kind of bail across the runoff area. And I think he hit the metal bollard across the track. Um, and I didn't really think too much of it when he went off and I saw him come back on, but I saw his wishbone overtaking him. Uh, and at that point I was like, oh no. So I went hard right hand down and I knew Ollie was there, but I was like, I'm sorry, Ollie, but the wishbone, the wishbone um, is more important than, than your side pod. So we both went off. I think he hit the Aramco banner. I hit something else uh, and rejoined in our respective positions, but it was quite entertaining because uh, I think Ollie couldn't work out where I'd just gone right hand down the exit of a corner into him. I just assert your authority. That whole no. chaos just sounds like the most Formula 3 thing I could imagine. Like I was watching it, of course. I wasn't there. And listening to Harry Benjamin commentate on it, I don't know how he does it. There's so much that's happening. It was mental. And then uh, I think the VSC or the yellow flags got called. But all the basically in F3, we have like a radio system. So when the, the yellow flags come out, we get a beep in our ear. Mm. And I'm pretty sure all the rookies thought the VSC had come out, including myself. So everyone lifted off into the next corner because we saw the, see the crash, but it was just a yellow. And then the VSC came out. Um, but I, again, it was really confusing because I think it was F, the safety car initially before VSC. And uh, I think some of the, I think I was 50 seconds positive on Delta because someone thought it was a full safety car. So the whole group was just backed up so hard from, I think it was P5 downwards. I think it was Hadjar was really, really slow under VSC for some reason. So it was chaotic, but I, I mean, we had a driver's briefing for about an hour and a half about VSC procedures. And it was still unclear at the end of it. So I'm not surprised that at round one, there was some issues with it. That's so funny. These are the things we just don't see because they, yeah, you know, they, don't, they don't televise the driver's briefings. Logan, I'm actually going to throw to you as a final sort of things. What are you finding with uh, this, this difference in going into this championship this year from the Formula Ford? I know you mentioned UAE before, but the prep before a race, is there anything particularly you're noticing different? Um, nothing 
two particularly different sort of thing. The, the team that I'm racing with, we've always kind of, I've raced with them for the last few years and in club racing, we've kind of always operated above a club racing level. Um, mm. And we've now kind of stepped into our own with being on a proper, I guess you could say junior series and being on the, um, partnering up, I guess, with GB3 and being on that paddock, it's, it's now almost like we are where, supposed, where we are supposed to be. Um, but with the drivers that are out in the championship, you've got myself, Tom, Alex, Megan, Max, that have all jumped up from Formula Fords and have all gone wheel banging with each other at one point. Um, I don't think it'll be the same sort of racing this year with how much more expensive it is to replace a corner. Um, but even the racing that was yesterday up at Not Kill, the National Formula Ford Championship was there. There's there's no quarter given to anybody else on track. So I think for what is to come with the drivers that have all seen each other before and the ones that haven't, I think it should be really good. Well, it's a long answer to, to Wally and we've got something from Logan uh, there, but the short version I thought was Zach was just showing his male dominance over you, Wally. So uh, right hand down, if you ever go near him, don't try it again. Exactly. <laughs> I tried it in race one, but it didn't quite work out. So I thought I'd finish him off in race two. <laughs> well, on that note, uh, thank you, everybody joining us. Thank you, everybody listening. That's all the time we have for you this week. If you'd like to have your question asked on a future episode, use the hashtag AskF1FS on Twitter. Drop any questions below if you're watching on YouTube or let us know what questions you have on your mind on our Discord. Look for the podcast questions channel. And if you are watching on YouTube, dropping a like on the video, leaving a comment and subscribing to the channel all really helps us out. And if you're listening, leaving a review on the podcast platform you're listening on is greatly appreciated. Finally, check out f1feederseries.com for more feeder series insight and follow F1 Feeder Series 1, F1 FS Americas and F1 FS Live on Twitter. You can find the links to all of those plus the Twitter accounts for myself and everybody else on the podcast in the YouTube description or the podcast show notes. Until next time, we have been the F1 Feeder Series podcast. Goodbye. Goodbye.